Hello and welcome to the New Zealand Initiative's webinar and report launch. My name is Oliver Hartwig. I'm the executive director of the initiative and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the launch of our report, The Power of Freedom, How Personal Budgets for Social Services Are Transforming Lives. This report has just come out. It's authored by our senior research fellow, Matt Burgess, with a foreword uh, from Bill English. And we look forward to discussing this report with you. Initially, of course, we had planned to have a, a report launch in our office in Wellington, but of course, circumstances don't allow that. But then again, that might be a blessing in disguise because we had a lot of feedback from members all around the country and indeed from outside of New Zealand, how interested they are in the topic and they can now all connect with us. We also had some um, contacts from Australian friends. And I know that, for example, there are representatives from the Australian Minister for the National oh, Disability yeah. Schemes people with us today. So welcome to our friends in Australia as well. It is a very timely discussion because we think we need to find better ways to deliver social services to those who need them. And the best way we think to achieve that is to empower those people that we want to help with these measures. So it's my great pleasure to welcome our four speakers today. Um, we will first hear from Matt Burgess, the author of the report. And uh, he will give us a summary of the report and um, tell us um, what is happening in the sector and how individualized funding as a scheme works. We will then hear from um, two people who have personal experience with individualized funding, and that is Philip Patston. He's mentioned actually on page nine of the report, which you can find on our website, and he is quoted there as saying that he doesn't just want a good life, he wants an effing great life, and individualized funding has helped him achieve that. We'll then hear from Lisa Holton and her daughter Sarah about their experiences with individualized funding, and finally, last but not least, we'll have Sir Bill English with us. We have invited him today not as a friend of the initiative, which he is, he's also a member of the initiative for West Farmers. We've um, invited him not as a recovering or as Bill tells me, a recovered politician, but also mainly as chair of Manawanui and that's New Zealand's leading facilitator of individualized funding. He's also written the foreword to the report, as I mentioned before. Now, for all of you, you can ask your questions about the report. You can ask questions about individualized funding. You can all do this online. The code is behind me. The code is also here in the chat messages and you would have seen it in the invitations. It's very simple. You go to slido.com, you type in the code, which is 483738. You can ask your question, you can vote on other questions and then we'll go through our speakers, uh, through the questions after our speakers. But for now, um, I'll invite Matt Burgess to open the debate and tell us about the report. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Oliver, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for taking the time uh, for this report launch. Um, this report started with a story over a beer uh, nearly a year ago. It was about a man receiving disability support uh, under traditional services model uh, by service provider, that is by uh, services provided um, through a company contracted to a ministry. That model works for perhaps 80% of disability uh, support recipients, but it's a dependency model. Uh, this man didn't feel in control of his own life under traditional services. He was frustrated to the point that he was lashing out uh, to people that are trying to help him. It got to the point where people wouldn't work with him. And then he shifted to an entirely different model of support called individualized funding or IF. Uh, and with IF, he got his own personal budget, and with that money, he could use it to buy support when he wanted it from who he wanted it. Uh, and this man flourished. IF made him the chief executive of his own small business. It put him in control. And so that was the story that started this whole report. And when I heard it, two things immediately struck me. The first is that if the person receiving the support is also the employer, you're probably gonna get a better service. And the second is, why aren't we doing IF for everything? What's stopping that? So today's report attempts to answer those questions around quality of service and scalability. I'm so pleased to be joined today uh, by Sir Bill, by Philip and Lisa, uh, who have each contributed uh, to today's report. 
Um, IEF individualized funding has achieved scale. Uh, out of 43,000 people who receive disability support in this country, 8,000 are now on IEF. The largest IEF host is Mana Wanui, started in 2004, the first IEF host. Uh, and I want to thank Marsha Marshall, the chief executive, and her team who have helped me uh, understand the system uh, that they've helped build. But this is not really a, a report about IEF per se. This is about personal budgets, uh, of which IEF is one flavor, but there are a number of others in this ecosystem. The idea behind this report is to compare traditional services, uh, top-down disability support, to bottom-up personal budgets in terms of quality of service and the outcomes that are achieved under each of those models. And let me tell you, it is the difference between night and day. Uh, the exact words Lisa memorably used uh, when I met her and Sarah uh, late last year at the start of this process. Throughout this report, we've re reviewed research from New Zealand and from overseas. And it's, it's not just that the weighted evidence supports uh, the performance of personal budgets. It's that nearly all of the evidence supports the performance of personal budgets. It's overwhelming. It's hard to think of another um, set of social outcomes that have been so clearly favored uh, from the findings of research. Personal budgets produce a step change in productivity, bang for per buck, if you like. Uh, and those benefits are mostly captured by recipients and also by support workers who are paid more under IF and other personal budget models. So I put the, uh, the benefits of the personal budgets, IF models, uh, into three categories. Quality of service, expanded opportunities in life, and dignity. Uh, personal budgets give you more flexible and more reliable services. Uh, and reliability really matters. For some people, if your support worker doesn't turn up in the morning, that means you don't get out of bed today. It's that simple for some people. And that makes it hard to hold down a job. Or if you turn to your family to step in when uh, the social worker doesn't turn up, uh, it makes it hard for your family to make plans as well. IEF and personal budgets also give you the opportunity to live at home, whereas under traditional uh, services, you might have to move into a communal facility. And because personal budgets put one person, you, the recipient, in control of decisions, it means it's much better at solving logistic problems, particularly around travel. And the, it also gives you the flexibility to change plans at the last moment, to go to the movies tonight or out for dinner. These things are really hard under uh, the traditional model. With IEF and other personal um, budgets, you can take your support person with you when you travel, including overseas, if you decide that's how you want to spend your money. Research uh, reaches two other conclusions, which I'll touch on quickly. Fraud is rare uh, with this decentralized model, both here and overseas, extremely rare. And research also reaches ambiguous conclusions as to whether personal budgets uh, save the Crown money or not. People have different views on this question. The research didn't reach a firm conclusion on that question. Personal budgets have actually been around for a while in this country. Uh, and they came about because they were demanded by people like Philip, who we're gonna hear from in a moment, who weren't getting the services and the support that they needed uh, under the traditional model. Philip, I hope he doesn't mind me saying, um, was working overseas, needed to catch flights and often needed support uh, at three o'clock in the morning. And he wasn't able to get that reliably through traditional support. And it eventually got to the point where Philip just told officials, just give me the money and I'll take care of it. And they did. And that was the start of personal budgets and IF uh, in this country nearly 30 years ago. Uh, IF isn't easy. Uh, when you're on IF, you have to manage your personal budget. You don't have to employ people. You can contract, but most people do employ. And that means you take on all the responsibilities of being an employer, paying wages, taxes, dealing with the Holiday Pay Act, uh, the risk of personal grievances, insurance, and so on. So recipients don't do it alone. They get help from host organizations like Manawanui. There are eight other host providers around the country. And hosts help recipients in a variety of ways. Uh, they, everybody gets a coach, help on using, uh, managing their budget, making a plan, checks and balances on, on where the spending goes and so on. 
The system also recognizes agents who can make decisions on behalf of the support recipient if they themselves are not in the position to make decisions. And, and very often that person will be a family member. Uh, I won't get into the details of how IF works, I uh, hadn't got enough time, but one element I do want to touch on is rules around spending. Uh, money Under IF, money has to go towards uh, supporting your disability. And money can't be spent on things that are already funded by uh, elsewhere by government. And that's important because it means most IF recipients can't use their personal budgets to buy equipment, only services. Uh, and that's quite a significant limitation uh, on how they can use their money. But those spending rules exist for a reason. Uh, from the government's perspective, personal budgets can look risky. Uh, and really there's two types of risks here. One is that when you're allocating funding down to individual levels, thousands of people at a time, um, you can never quite be sure that something unexpected and unhelpful is going to happen somewhere. This is a so-called Dominion Post test, or as the Herald calls it, the front page of the newspaper test. The idea that officials or ministers don't want to end up on the front page of the newspaper because something unexpected has happened uh, somewhere in the country. The other risk, around personal budgets uh, is fiscal. There's the potential for unanticipated uh, expansion of entitlements that creates or blows out budgets um, at, uh, in unexpected ways. And that's, that's the risk that officials uh, are right to worry about. So these are constraints on uh, scalability that are important. So the spending rules are there to protect the system. But those, ball, uh, those rules bump right into a human rights uh, element or dimension to this whole thing. Why are we attaching spending rules to disability to support, but not to benefits? There's a tension here between um, these different objectives. But I don't want to be critical. Uh, hopefully you can get a sense of what has been achieved here. It's not a small thing for public policymakers to build a system that can allocate decision-making all the way down to the individual. That is a significant achievement. In fact, arguably one of the more significant achievements in public policy um, in the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, so I think credit is due to the Ministry of Health, uh, which has built the system uh, over the last 20 to 25 years. Uh, it was a thrill for me to connect to people uh, at the Ministry, Amanda, Claire and Christy. Uh, I get the sense they're even more passionate about personal budgets than what I am. Uh, and I get a sense that uh, the system the model's in good hands uh, with those people. The war has to keep being won within the ministry and the government more widely for the use of personal budgets. They're not widely understood or necessarily liked by everybody in the system. So we have, uh, and I'm grateful uh, for their help in preparing this report, uh, a very timely help too, I should add. So we have this uh, great innovation in personal budgets. It has a track record that works, now the question is, what else can we do with this technology? Well, potentially anything where services can be delivered at home. So things like aged care or mental health or potentially drug and alcohol rehabilitation come to mind. Uh, so DHBs are critical and we need another innovation that gives DHBs a way to look seriously at the personal budgets model uh, and start using it more widely in a way that doesn't expose them uh, in fiscal terms, because that's, I think, the main constraint. In the disability space, I think the challenge is to find ways to relax purchasing rules uh, so that people can uh, make trade-offs between equipment and service purchases. Uh, that has the potential to unlock another step change um, in productivity of spending with um, huge potential well-being gains. But we have a wonderful opportunity here uh, with this platform that's now achieved scale uh, through IF and other types of personal budget. Um, what else can we do? I think the future is exciting. Uh, back to you, Oliver. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And uh, once again, congratulations on a fantastic report, uh, a really timely publication. Also, congratulations, by the way, on having the biggest ever report launch we hosted because we have almost 200 people on the call. It's probably more than we would have fit into our small office. So <laughs> thanks to COVID. Um, it's now my pleasure to invite um, Philip Hudson to come and tell us about his personal experience. And I'm very glad to see Philip on this webinar because we are going back a while. I think we first met around 2012 or 13 at the B Leadership Training Program. And so it's great to see you again, Philip. And we look forward to hearing your story now. 
Thank you, Oliver, the curator, Coco. Um, I'd like to start by just congratulating uh, Matt and the museum initiative on this report. Um, not only is it a great, um, a great way of telling the story of ICE, but it's bringing the um, issue out of government and um, and the sector and bringing it into business and economic realms. And this is where I think the strength of IF is, is that it is about money. It's about having the resource to become part of the economy and it's an investment in people rather than a cost. Um, we were talking earlier that that with IF we become employers. Um, we also create employment for other people. And I think this is a, one of the main changes in, in this, is that um, a colleague in Australia once said that disabled people are subject to the subtle the subtle bigotry of low expectations. And what IF is doing is saying, actually, we have higher expectations of disabled people in that they can manage and support themselves without having a, a middle body. Um, facilitation that. Um, in the system at the moment, or the old system, we actually had two, two middlemen, the needs assessment service and then the agency that provided the support. Um, what I does is take away one of those middlemen, the agency, and that's got to be a saving to the government, and, and that's the potential. What we now need, and this is my challenge to, to the sector, is that we need to get rid of this needs assessment um, requirement because I'm 53 and I know what I need and yet I'm forced to use that needs assessment service whether I need it or not. Needs assessment needs to be, become a chosen service for people, people should be able to use their budget to engage and need the sector if they need it. Um, we could then free up millions and millions of dollars that go into the bureaucracy behind providing support for people. That is the challenge. That is really lifting the bar on the expectations of people by acknowledging that we can, we can sort out what we need and what we don't and be honest and open about that. And if we need help, we can find systems to help us do that. So that's the next step. Let's move our, our expectations up. Um, let's look at more than just good lives. Um, if, if 
that Steve Jobs had just wanted to make a good phone, we would still be on, on the iPhone 1. <laughs> he didn't say, I want to make a good phone. He said, I want to make a great phone. And in fact, what he actually wanted to do was change the world and change the way technology impacted on the world. And now we see the iPhone 12, which is a completely different beast than the iPhone 1. So let's drop this ordinary life, good life, and let's get people having, eating great lives. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip, for sharing your experience. That was great to hear. Can I now invite um, Lisa and her daughter, Sarah, to join us? And um, for that, you would have to unmute, hopefully. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'm speaking kind of with Sarah on her behalf. So Sarah's <laughs> non-verbal, but she will make some noise to participate. She has a lot to say. She just doesn't have the words like we do. Um, so our experience with IF was started about 10, 11 years ago. Um, we used to use agency support for a support worker to come into the house and the agency never had any replacements um, and we just felt like it wasn't a highly valued role, like they were paid the same as flipping a burger at McDonald's, but you're, ah. you're, you've got a responsibility that's way more than that. So we found out about individual ah. funding through other families and switched over so that we could pay carers a decent yeah. hourly rate. Um, yeah, because if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. Um, well, don't want to, yeah, if you, un you understand what I mean. So that's the initial reason why we moved over was to pay carers more. Um, and I think through that, what we've found through that is really that the locus of control changes from being with the agency um, where you can ask for such things and such needs and they can't meet them, but you bang your head against the wall to the locus of control being with us if we need another staff member, we just advertise, and we find them. We, um, so the whole flexibility is so much better. You can find people that work, work with your life. So you're not, living, you're not living your life around an agency's timetable. Your staff support your timetable and your family because they're, the whole family lives with the disability, not just the disabled person. So over the years, Sarah has a, a younger sibling who is involved in sport, social things, um, school, and our care needs have changed around that whole family environment. Um, so I've been able to support her sibling in ways that I would not have been able to support him if we were under an agency. Um, so that's made a big difference to his life as well. So, you know, I think economically we have to look at how the, the wider economic implications when a family is not supported or the way that they're supported. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and I would say the, along with the carers having better pay, it's, it's a better culture for them as well. So if Sarah has an event to go to or she's going to meet up with people or family or birthday, um, the support comes with her, they eat uh, with her. Um, they don't bring their own lunch to sit down at a restaurant and eat their own lunch while uh, the rest of the order. And that culture to us is really, really important that they are one of us, we're a team uh, and they're not an outsider. So. A lot of the times people think that Sarah's support workers are um, her sister or family. They don't realize that they're actually employed staff. Ah. They don't look like staff. They don't wear shirts with 
badges or anything. They're just um, friends. <laughs> um, oh. so the other thing too is that, you know, overseer is life from school age. So I'd need help in the morning and afternoon um, around school to now as an adult, it's allowed Sarah to be who she wants to be. So she has her van, her carers. She goes to activities in the community that are meaningful to her. Um, she doesn't have to pick them out of a, a box of, well, here's, here's your one or two activities that you can choose to go to. She chooses what's meaningful for her. So Sarah um, has become quite a successful artist through the support of IF. And um, that has really increased her self-efficacy to who she is in the world. Um, she's a mainstream artist now, not just in the disability world, but she's in the Auckland art community. She has, um, yeah, she's really branched out. And I'd say that increases her well-being. So of who you are, who you participate in the community um, and what you can do. She's been to the top of the North Island. She's been in helicopters, jet boats, luges, um, yeah, limos <laughs> for her 25th birthday. We wouldn't have been able to have the support. We go away to see family. She can go and see family, take her staff, their accommodations paid, their foods paid, their tickets, entry into to support her into places are paid. We just could not live this life without this funding like this. Um, she also got herself a beach chair last year. Um, she had an underspend, so we spent the underspend on a beach chair so she can get on the beach first time in years. So, yeah, that's ma it makes a huge difference to our lives. I hope I haven't gone over my time. <laughs> oh, you're t totally fine. Thank you, Lisa and Joe. Thank you, Sarah. That was great to hear. We now hand over to Bill English. Bill, you would have to unmute yourself. Thank you, I think. It's working. Over to you. Thank you very much, Oliver. And can I thank uh, Philip and Lisa and Sarah for coming on and telling their stories. Um, because <clears throat> in the end, individualized funding is all about that sense of agency, uh, which you're hearing about. And I just want to provide a bit of a, a bit of general policy context, I suppose, being a um, policy wonk. Uh, and then talk about some of the aspects of, of this, uh, which I think are so important for social policy uh, and the people who need good policy uh, looking ahead. Uh, th this is, it's interesting, I think, when there's so much focus on COVID, uh, that these, fam these households, these families remind us that whatever's going on at the one o'clock press conference, uh, life goes on, uh, particularly for people with chronic disabilities. And they just have they have ongoing challenges, a lot of which are related to the a permanent kind of lockdown. You know, where getting out and about uh, and be, being part of normal life is uh, is a real challenge for them and for their families. And uh, that's one way I've been looking at lockdown is it's it's a bit of an experience, just a shadow of what it's like for uh, uh, people with chronic disabilities. So just a bit of context. Uh, about 15% of the population with the highest needs use half of all public services. Unfortunately, the system wasn't designed for that half. It's designed for the other 85%. And you've now got a, a universal welfare state designed 70, 80, 90 years ago uh, to meet a need that existed then, which was to get commodity services out to the whole population to make sure everyone had an education, everyone had access to healthcare, uh, everyone had a welfare system as a safety net. Uh, but that's reached its limit some time ago. You know, you need that function, but it can't cope with complexity. And I'll spend a bit of time in government trying to solve these problems. Uh, and government departments collaborating is not an answer to the challenges of life for Sarah uh, and Lisa and thousands of families like them. And so if people who have complex needs find themselves in sort of broad bureaucratic categories 
bumping around the system trying to stitch together bits of commodity type service that's designed essentially for the average, uh, not, for, not for people with intensive and complex needs. So individualized funding is a big jump out of that system uh, to one where the person who decides what services are needed is the person who needs the service. And as the report shows, uh, they, it turns out they have a pretty good idea. And you've heard that talked about here today. They have a pretty good idea of what their needs are. Uh, and it's not some average service decided uh, by, the, by um, a large monopoly public uh, agency. Uh, and that's the, the core of individualized funding is the sense of agency. And that's why in this world, we, we refer uh, to people um, uh, like Sarah and Philip as customers. You know, just because they have a disability doesn't mean they shouldn't be able to push and shove to get what they want. Uh, they shouldn't be, they should, of course, they should be able to complain. They should be able to compare services like everyone else does. And in this case, I mean, these are thousands of people who are the statutory employers of their staff. And that's one thing I find I'm involved in the, in the business of supporting individualized funding. Uh, people who aren't in that world find it hard to understand that uh, people with chronic disabilities can function as a small business, as a statutory employer, like or their agent, like it's not made up. It's not some strategy or some advocacy trick it's actually people doing the job of hiring uh, who's going to look after them or deciding not to hire and actually spend the money on some other, some other need, which will be a micro need. And I suppose that's my next point. You can't expect a large monopoly public service to, to accommodate, to understand everybody's needs and accommodate them. But it's time we recognise the limitations of that because the limitations of that fall hardest on those with the least resource and those with the, the most chronic need. That's who pays the price of the kind of dumb services uh, that, we, that, that, that are the mainstream. And I, mean, I just mean dumb in the sense that they're, they're, not out, they're not determined by the needs of the person who's getting them. They're to a significant extent determined by the supplier of the services. They decide, and because they're a monopoly, they can. Uh, <clears throat> so individualized funding, gets over the limitations of the universal services. You need those, but it is, it would be good if people operating universal services understood the limitations of them, and then they might be a bit more able to adapt uh, to systems that, that foster this complex need. And I want to compliment the Ministry of Health, uh, as Matt said, on the fact that they've developed this, and it's, it is the best example of personal budgets in the world, I know there's people from Australia listening. Uh, the NDIS is a fantastic philosophy. It's on a much larger scale than in New Zealand. It's the whole system. Uh, the problem is it's a bureaucrat's version of individual choice. It's just overly regulated and bureaucratized and very expensive to run. Uh, that brings me to another insight around this is trust. Uh, you know, I'm a, I've been the finance minister, so I know what fiscal risk looks like and how to contain it. And just one telling stat, uh, people on individualized funding generally spend up to about 80% of their budget. And a small number of them have problems with managing their budget. Uh, they are much better fiscal managers than public agencies. That's the truth of it. And uh, they can be trusted to know what works for them. Uh, but another reason they can, be, they can be trusted is they know that if they make a mistake, in uh, a lot of mistakes, then the system will disappear. They'll get kicked off the system. So there's a self-reinforcing sense of responsibility, which gives a agency to control the public budget to individuals. Um, I think a further insight is around technology. One of the reasons that your universal system can't adapt its services is because traditionally, it's been very expensive to know what people's preferences were and uh, really complicated to allow them to um, express those preferences. You know, you see this argument going on in education all the time. It's just politically difficult to allow parents to exercise choice, for instance. But technology these days allows 
you to aggregate, uh, to understand, uh, aggregate and execute thousands of choices at once. I mean, there's 10,000, eight to 10,000 people in New Zealand on IF, all making their own choices. And uh, what enables that at scale is technology. Now I'm involved in um, uh, a company called Wes Farmers that owns Bunnings and Kmart. And I can tell you the sophistication and the technology that goes into making sure that an individual can walk into Kmart and Patoni and choose the t-shirt they want is vastly greater than what goes into enabling people with chronic disabilities to uh, run their own lives. So which one's more important, the right colored t-shirt for a 16 year old in Patoni uh, or Sarah? Well, I think it's pretty obvious and we should be using that technology which enables millions of individualized offers. That's what Amazon does. It does hundreds of millions of individualized offers. Uh, but the gap between that technology and the public sector is growing rapidly, particularly over the last, the last, three, uh, the last three or four years. So the final point is just where to next. Uh, well, this kind of support system with personalized budgets, which are fully accountable and transparent, uh, can be pointed at, 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 at any number of other groups. At the moment, it's sort of categorized under disability. Uh, I'm involved in a privately funded trial of operating it for people with mental health, uh, real mental health challenges, serious and chronic mental health challenges. And um, that's, uh, that's been um, challenging, but gritty and uh, some real progress. There's other significant groups, aging, the aging population, uh, families who are tied up in the learning support system, uh, which you know regularly comes to a boil with advocacy and and arguments and reviews and recommendations <laughs> because the people in it don't have don't have refined choices to exercise their preferences for their child who's in the you know the one or two percent that have real learning challenges and real and chronic disabilities. Um, Fana or is another area where self direction, um, if you think of this as philosophy of self direction has survived um, political change uh, and is, is getting a grip in, in, in communities where the traditional welfare state has drained their sense of agency uh, because people with low resource get exhausted and frustrated just trying to make things hang together. And we hear those stories every day, every single day in the disability sector. And that's why um, there's so much motivation um, across the, all the providers of IF uh, and the policy people who backed it, uh, so much motivation uh, to make it work. Just give people that uh, strong sense of agency. And in the end, it's a very simple idea. Treat them with respect as if they're customers of the system, not passive recipients of well-intended um, universal services. Great. Thank you very much, Bill, and indeed, um, thank you to all our speakers so far, Matt, Philip, Lisa, and Sarah, for explaining how individualized funding works, what it is, and what <coughs> it means to your lives. Um, we now have time for questions, and just as a reminder, you can ask your questions on slido.com. The code is 483738. We have got quite a few questions already, but the first one, actually the most popular um, message on Slido is not even a question. It's um, saying thank you for sharing your stories, Philip, Lisa, and Sarah. You're all inspirational. So I think we'll start with that. Indeed. Indeed. The first question here, anonymous question, is how different is IF to the Fano Aura model? Who would like to take that? That's a good one for Bill. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> all right, just say, just say it again, Oliver. How different. How different is individualist funding to the Fano Oro model? Oh, it's the same philosophy. I mean, it's, uh, you know, Fano Oro was built around um, the idea of tino ranga tiratanga, self self determination, and so is this. And that's what they have in common. Uh, interestingly, you have to go right to the edges of the system to sort of have political permission to do this stuff. Um, so the you know the families with the greatest need, um, the families with the chronic issues but certainly that's where it has the biggest impact because they are people for whom the mainstream system was never really designed to work and struggles to accommodate 
So this is quite, it's quite different. You, you kind of can't do individualized funding within the mainstream service delivery. You go outside and, you know, people find what works for them. They fill the little gaps in their lives they want filled, the little gap micro needs that no one else can see. Matt, would you like to comment on that too? Well, I just think of, you have a continuum here of decision-making. Uh, at one end of it, you have all the decisions uh, being made by cabinet, and at, at the other end of it, you have individualized funding where individuals are choosing which services they buy. And you've got a fairly smooth continuum between those two points. So as I understand it, Whanau Ora is a, um, is a commissioning model. So you might think of that as sitting about halfway down the, um, down the continuum there. And really, the... <laughs> You know, the principle is that the lower you go, the better the decisions make are uh, going to be, the better decisions that are going to be made because there's more information there. Uh, and trade-offs, really complicated trade-offs are actually obvious and simple for the individual's um, concern. So the question is, how do you confront the individual with uh, choices about how to make best use of uh, limited funds? Uh, and that's what the IF model does. Um, it's really not the dynamic you get from uh, from when decision making is allocated elsewhere. So that's what makes personal budget so special. I'd like to add that Pano or often operates in an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. And the issues that um, Pano or deal with are often even always to do with poverty. And so using an IE model in Pano Aura could stop this sort of this, this waiting till people get so bad that they need to be bore up again and giving people resources in a in a capitalist society. Thank you, Philip. Um, I have to juggle a bit because we have questions now coming both on slido.com but also directly here on Zoom. I mean, two questions are quite similar, actually. The most popular question here on Slido is, do you think that individualized funding would ever be accepted as a model for the provision of universal health system access in New Zealand? And perhaps related to that, um, are there any other adaptations Philip and Lisa and Sarah would propose for individualized funding in a perfect world? Lisa. A bunch of them, uh, or Lisa or Philip, actually. Yeah. Maybe Lisa. Um, I, I, I think the, the frustration for me with individualized funding would be um, having the money, but not the, um, the service to purchase or the thing to purchase. So for Sarah, Sarah is quite um, medically fragile. So her level of care is more along a nursing side you can't see it but Sarah has um, a stomach tube she has a suction machine she has oxygen that she needs on and off she has quite restricted medications that are um, you need a lot of training to work with her so she's more like a nursing level but the NASC this um, assessment is one stop one price for all so for us, we need to purchase um, an, a nurse type uh, person, but that costs a lot more than what we're funded for the hourly gross amount. And then there's a gap between your support worker and your nurses. We want someone in here. We can't afford a nurse. The support workers aren't highly enough trained. There's no career for them. So it, there's, there's a lot of workforce development that needs to go alongside this. I see that there is an, an apprenticeship thing, just a new thing I heard about. I haven't looked into it too much about what that looks like, but I would say the workforce is the next part for us that, you know, we've got really good support workers, um, but I, I would say they're hard to find, you know? So workforce for us, yeah. And maybe a scale of um, a scale of hourly rates, like ACC have their serious injury clients who are funded at a higher rate than non-serious injury. 
but in disability we have the same needs as serious injury but we're not funded like that we're funded for the same as someone who doesn't need all this medical need so yeah that's our frustration thank you the other question was perhaps more for bill are there any other applications of this model in health access or maybe even beyond health well, just to pick up from uh, where Lisa left off, you know, this is about dealing with the challenges and opportunities and potential of an individual. And if you think of an individual like Sarah, uh, if things go wrong for her, uh, you know, that's a real a real challenge for the system. And you know, she's had pretty probably had pretty extensive medical care over the years. Uh, so where it needs to move to is dealing with the high need people, one high needs one at a time. There's no reason why the system can't adapt to adding on, adding up the health needs that Sarah has, just in the same way as with our families with say young autistic children. Uh, we couldn't add on the educa add in the education budget to the care budget. I mean, there's there's not there's not unlimited numbers of people. And the technology makes the transaction costs of these things remarkably low compared to what's done in the mainstream, uh, where, where agencies, I think, just aren't aware of how far, um, how far the tools have evolved to enable dealing with, these, dealing with people as individuals, because there'll only be a few thousand of them. You know, there's not, we're not talking about 30 million or something. There's handfuls of them by the comparison of any kind of uh, measure in the rest of the world. Hmm. Matt, Philip? I think um, just very quickly, the kind of a paradox around paying for health, I would hate to see New Zealand in that like the US where people are having to individually pay for health. And for me, health care and wellness should actually be something that a civil society makes available to everyone free of time. Thank you. We have to talk a bit about Australia now because we have um, a couple of questions uh, on Australia. Um, first, a message from Australia, actually from Peter Seaton, my old friend in Sydney. Um, and she says that uh, many of the principles of individualized funding got lost early on in the development of the National Disability Insurance Scheme in Australia. And corresponding to that remark, we'll have Alan Judge saying the costs of the NDIS in Australia have blown out massively. How would you stop that from happening in New Zealand? Well, it, it, it simply hasn't happened in New Zealand. Uh, and that's because it's, well, the, you know, it, how this works in New Zealand is just with the current budget. So it doesn't actually expand entitlement. It just means people can take their entitlement in cash or in kind. And if they take it in cash, they've got, um, they've got uh, options with that. So you don't need, I mean, of course, there's always an argument for growing the spending. But uh, what's happened in New Zealand, which I think Matt pointed out has been remarkably successful, is that the Ministry of Health come up, have come up with a process that does manage the fiscal risk and has done so. And we see it every day where most of the participants spend under their budget. What The next step is not so much to grow the amount of each budget, but to stitch the budgets together for the different aspects of the of people, say of you know Sarah's life, uh, and that what you'll find in that is massive efficiencies when you get the in, the higher need people trading off across. You know these budgets can be quite large, a hundred, two hundred thousand for the for the really high end, uh, high end needs. Now you get massive efficiencies over the existing use of the money, and then you can have another separate argument about whether to increase the entitlement. In Australia, they seem to have ended up with much bigger budgets without actually making the choice to do that. But that's because they've built in enormous transaction costs. That, that, that hasn't helped. And um, that is supported actually by a comment here from Des Gorman. Remember the Australian model is still menu-based. It's pick and mix and consequently not innovative. It supplies more of the same. 
Så det er fast test. Ja, og regrettet er de DC'er, um, der India er et hæftigt rig, men det er en type rig år. Og jeg vil gå tilbage til at sige, sådan for en nedsigtsmænd, at money spent on regulating and gatekeeping budgets and I think we need to, as you said Bill, trust people to know what they need and to make those decisions themselves. Hmm. Can I just uh, add something? Please. Um, you know, what, as I mentioned in my intro, um, you have this enormous step change in productivity, uh, which is mostly being captured by uh, the individuals themselves, which is great. Uh, you know, with my economist hat on, you can think of that as surplus that has the potential to be shared. And if it's sh some of that is shared back to the crown, then that takes the form of savings. And it would actually be helpful uh, in terms of improving the scalability of the system if it can develop a reputation as being a way to manage fiscal pressures. Uh, and there's a clear mechanism for it to do that because of this enormous bang for buck productivity lift that you are getting from giving people control over decision making. So it's not, it's, it's, it's what Bill said about only spending 80%, but also the fact that every dollar goes so much further uh, that, that can be, um, to put it crudely, monetized by the, the Crown in the form of savings. So, um, at the moment, personal budgets and IEF don't have that reputation um, in government agencies, uh, is my perception, um, but it can get that. Uh, and if it can, then I think uh, you could see, you know, that's going to help uh, improve uptake. Okay. I've got a top question here on Slido from Louise Upston. And she asks, could the personal budget approach be rolled out to sole parents? And if yes, what do you see the benefits and risks would be? Well, I'll have a go. I mean, the way I've thought about it is not so much, um, it's more of a needs, we're going to be rolled out in terms of needs rather than circumstances, if that makes sense. So the three that I mentioned, I mean, the big opportunity is aged care because it's so large and there's a clear opportunity to keep people in their own homes um, with a personal budgets approach. So it's, um, yeah, so I, I guess, you know, the opportunities that I've seen and happy to hear from others is around aged care, mental health, um, alcohol and drug rehab, um, but potential uh, for application anywhere. Anywhere as services can be provided at home. Okay. Um, is there any evidence of the individual funding system being abused? And if so, what recourse is there for the government or taxpayers? It's an anonymous question we got on Slido. Yeah, it's an important question. It was one of the first questions I had too, is, you know, what happens when you give uh, control over public spending uh, to thousands of people? Um, how much uh, untoward activity do you get? The answer is not very much. Uh, a handful over um, 20 years, in fact. And that's the, that's the outcome uh, in other countries as well. Part of it, uh, I think part of it is just goodwill that people like the system and understand that um, abusing it doesn't help uh, them or anybody else. But also the system, you know, we've got a plural system here. Uh, People, you've got two systems running in parallel, the traditional support system uh, and individualized funding and other personal budgets. Uh, abusing uh, IEF uh, means you, you have to go back to the traditional support model. Uh, and that's a credible threat that encourages um, good behavior, I would have thought. So uh, the system is set up also to detect, um, fix the wrong word, but to monitor for um, unusual spending um, and to take action in response to that. There is a there's an audit unit within the Ministry of Health and hosts have responsibilities under their agreement with the ministry. So the systems are in place to um, make sure spending is, a, is within the rules. Uh, and that, that's one reason why we can have confidence that the system is, is safe and sound. Can, can, I just, um, can I just back up what Matt said? Look, th this is one of the basic understandings that, that would help if the policymakers got hold of it. Uh, the way that payment systems and banking systems work these days is a funder can look at every every transaction in real time. Uh, the traditional bureaucratic concept of audit is going and looking at it afterwards, of course, when it's too late. And it's understandable that you'd worry that you might find a mess and it's already happened. But now you can monitor in real time and the people who are being funded here understand that. 
they're making decisions, but they're trans their own decisions, but the, those decisions are transparent to the funder. And it and it's a very simple, boring administrative point, but it's a fundamental mind shift for a low trust universal system to get their head around. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. Um, I think there would be a small number of people that do abuse the system, um, but that would be balanced by people who Matt would say, and, or Bill, who only use 80% of their budget. Um, and again, we have to ask the question, we don't monitor what beneficiaries used their money for. And so why is there the scrutiny on disabled people um, and monitoring what what we use our budget for. It, it, it would be stupid for me to use it to go to the pub because I wouldn't be able to get up in the morning. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay, um, next question. What percentage of disabled people would be better off under the system? And are traditional services always going to be the majority? Lisa and Philip, be good to answer that. I, I would say that there's a place for the um, there's a place a place for service led provision. Like not everyone can manage employing people, um, but what I think is missing um, is a a place in between an agency and the person who can work freelance and help those families negotiate that path or mm. they pay a very small percentage for them to do that role like i'm an agent for sarah but if i wasn't here she can't have this model of funding then she has to go into residential care i don't want mm. that i want her to stay in this house that's modified for her with her budget get a flatmate and have a coordinator to manage her funding, she can't do it without my voluntary contribution because <sighs> she can't do anything with her hands and communicate well enough to manage it like Philip does. So there is a little gap there missing of, um, of where it wouldn't work for her without me, which is honestly freaks me out because her life would just, the rug would just get pulled out from underneath her feet if I wasn't here so I've told her she has to go before me not after me <laughs> that's my one yeah. wish in life pretty mm. weird but um she's here for a good time not a long time and um I'd like I'd hate to leave her at the mercy of our system because she has this life um because I help her manage it so yeah that's a missing gap for us is is a, a, a role that's in between like where you don't give all your funding to an agency there's the locus of control again you know we have to have the power of of purchasing the purchasing power we we can't be at the mercy of of um service anymore well, we it's, need... it's a change from the medical model to the social model you know what are the barriers let's remove them we need a bit of both. We need the medical and the social together. Yeah. Sorry, Philip, you carry on. We need a market basis in the services. At the moment, services are given funding from the Ministry of Health and they have no, um, they have no incentive to provide a good service. Yeah. They just get funded. It's yeah people could pick and choose services, services would have to provide a unique value in order to um in order to um carry on the business mm -hmm. and that's what I'm missing at the moment. Yeah. Hmm. For you, Lisa, there was a message <clears throat> left on Zoom. Many of us feel that way. I'm a sole parent and got a terminal cancer diagnosis. 
cancer and death were the least of my worries. So you know, other people think... Oh, my so heart goes out to you. That's my worst nightmare. Mm -hmm. oh, we've got time yeah. for another couple of questions from Slido. Um, there's a question about the role of tech in enabling IF and how it could be, how could better tech mean better or wider individualized funding in the future? You know, I jumped in there because I was in the group of people that started um, Maru Nui. And um, one, of the, um, one of the things that we proposed for Maru Nui was a, a similar portal system that Maru Nui has now. But we were also thinking of talking to online banking services so that people could pay their workers directly from the portal. So the money comes into the portal, you've got all your employees' bank accounts in there, and you just go, Ching, and it gets paid. Um, and I think that is, a, again, the opportunity where we, we use similar technology like banks in this, in this area. Thank you. Maybe we can finish with one question and I'd like to invite you all to answer this briefly. What are the key ideas you would like political parties to take away from this report and this model when developing their own social policies? What would you like our politicians in all parties to do with that now? Maybe we'll start with you, Philip. Um, go on. Could go on for days talking about that. <laughs> I love that. Um, I think I'd like to go back to that subtle bigotry of low expectations. And I want to see people having much higher expectations of disabled people and their whanau and family. Um, and I want to see more ambition in the system and the ambition to make you know, New Zealand funded by many people, we could make one of the best systems in the world because we have a small scale to do that on. And that's the opportunity. Bill, what would you like your former colleagues uh, to do from all parties? Um, and I see we've got a few of them actually on the call. So you can speak to them directly. Oh, well, look, I think uh, first, there's, there is a big philosoph philosophical gap here between uh, the belief that people should put up with bad service so we can maintain the solidarity of the universal <laughs> welfare, which is a sort of traditional model and very conservative, or give people the opportunity to take their own responsibility and make their own choices, which does make the world a bit more complicated. But the success of it uh, will make the political argument. I mean, we're, everyone's been talking about well-being. Well, it's easy to talk about, but what you've heard today are just a couple of what are actually 10,000 stories on IF. And that's mm -hmm. just the actual employers. Then there's their families, which is on average two to three people, another 20 or 30,000. And then there's their carers, which is another 20 or 30,000. So you're talking about 50 or 60,000 people. Well, if you want to improve the live, improve the well-being mm. of other 50 or 60,000 people, we'll just create the policy space. And these are the people who will take the responsibility. So I'd say to the politicians, this is, uh, you know, trust the people, act on the evidence. This is yeah. the easiest way I can think of, and I've seen in 30 years, to make a high impact on people who really need it, right? This is where you make a big difference. It's not just some refinement on, on, on some mainstream service, like it has a transformative impact. And I only, I only use that word where it should be used and that's where you actually get transformation. And that's the impact it has. 
So just create the policy space and let this let this uh, let this system run. It'll develop its own momentum. Thank you, Bill. Lisa. Yeah. Um, yeah, so to, to um, add to that, what I've found um, through, and this comes about from wanting to purchase things, so I wanted to purchase a sewing machine because Sarah wants to put her art, like that's on the wall behind her that she paints with her head and her hands, onto fabric to make clothing. But she can't purchase the sewing machine because it's an asset. She can go to a sewing class on a certain day on a certain day of the week, certain time. If she has a seizure, she's not well, she misses out. She can't have a sewing machine to do this activity in her own time around her own support and her own health. Now that comes from an old cabinet um, <laughs> decision um, that was made years and years ago that it can own that that her activity post school funding <laughs> can only be used to purchase a service and not a, you know, an activity that's determined to be meaningful by somebody else, not her. So oh. there's a lot of strategies that the government has where it, it does not correlate to the policy. They can't actually implement the strategy because the policy doesn't reflect it. So they need to change those cabinet-made decisions and fast tracked it like COVID made shit happen real quick. Now, I believe that our government can make things happen real quick when they want to. So, you know, I really think that they have to match up their strategies with their policy so we can implement this and stop having years and years of pilot programs to prove it works. You know, we know it works. Don't make another version of it and do that for 10 years before another group of people can join. Like, trust us. Yeah, and you have to spend a bit of money to save a bit of money too, like, yeah. Thank you. Support finally, Matt. Through my support, I went to university through, through having individualized funding and having the support I had. I went to university, I got a degree. Um, you know, I'm not currently using that. Uh, that's another story on why <laughs> comes back to that who Sarah is indeed um, yeah Matt, like well said Lisa go on for days. You, <laughs> look um, I'd like to see political parties signal absolutely clearly that they support this model they'll follow the evidence um, and that's important because the people in the system in the ministries in the DHBs who are pushing this model uh, everybody around them needs to understand that the model has the backing of this government and the one after that and the one after that. So that this is a model that's worth supporting and investing in and growing um, because it's not going anywhere. So uh, raise awareness and signal absolute unwavering uh, support for a model because it's working, because it makes a difference. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. And that was really our intention as well, to raise awareness of this model, of the scheme, of the options and possibilities. So I thank you all on behalf of all our audience, which you've actually kept, um, and it's a record audience for a report launch we've ever had at the initiative. So thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you for being so brave and for telling us about how you um, use that model to improve your lives and how that has actually had an impact on you. So thanks to Philip, thanks to Lisa and Sarah, thanks to Bill, thanks to Matt for your contributions today and for your bravery in speaking out. And, um, Congratulations once again on a great report, which you can all find on our website. It's uh, at nzinitiative.org.nz. But for now, that's all. Thank you. You've got a virtual round of applause from our 200 um, people in the audience. And thank you so much for, for your time, for being with us today. Thank, thank you. you for doing the report, Matt. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank bye -bye. you. And your New Zealand initiative. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you.